southern tip of Chile is mountainous Patagonia, one of the last truly wild places on Earth. In our first report, Earthwise adventurer Michael Mojaleski treks to the raging heart of this raw, windswept world. Though the journey down to the end of South America takes over 24 hours, the opportunity to backpack in southern Chile's Patagonia provided the ability to explore a rare convergence of forests, glaciers, plains, and mountains. Hiking beneath a canopy of a hundred-year-old beech trees called Lenga, these woods are part of a remote forest undisturbed by man. In Torres del Paine National Park, I met local trekking guide Giovanna Ranieri, who had planned for me a five-mile trek through the forest on our way to explore Gray Glacier, a massive frozen plateau left over from the last ice age 14,000 years ago. As we entered the forest, Giovanna explained the classifications of some of the more common species here. The typical tree in the park is the Lenga, and that one is from the Notophagus family. And then we have the Koiwe and the Nire. They are also from Nothophagus family, but they have some differences. The Koiwe, it's evergreen, and the Lenga and the Nire, they are deciduous. So that means that they change their leaves in autumn. And it's so beautiful to see how they get red and orange, and then the Koiwe keeps green. All of the 10 species of beech that grow in South America are endemic to the southern Andes and don't grow north of the subtropical zone above 30 degrees latitude south. In March, the beginning of fall in southern Chile, the leaves were just starting to turn. Several thousand years ago, this forest was all unformed, still smothered under a great sheet of ice. The earth naturally warmed and the glacier retreated, allowing sunlight and rain to fall upon the land for the first time in five to eight thousand years. The landscape begins as bare rock and gravel, and as it heals, life emerges, first as mosses, weed, and thickets eventually growing into dense forest. With each new plant community comes new wildlife habitat, and today flocks of wild parakeets pass overhead. Though this part of the forest has escaped much interference by man, other woods nearby haven't been so lucky. In 1985, there was a huge fire in this park. This fire started in a campsite because the backpackers had left a fire. It was so big that it lasted about 15 days. In fact, this fire jumped over the river and they couldn't stop it because it was so windy. And that's really, really sad. There are no naturally occurring fires here as Patagonia's climate and temperature preclude lightning. So backpackers must be extremely careful to prevent future blazes and provide the woods time to fully recover. We exited the forest, still a few miles from Gray Glacier, and traverse the sandy, wind-swept plain. Soon we reach the edge of Lago Gray, or Gray Lake, 400 meters deep, formed by the natural melting and recession of the glacier. On the bottom of this lake are layers of deposits known as VARs, formed each season by glacial debris and carried into the lake by meltwater. Exploring the edge of the lake, evidence began to appear that we were not far off. Chunks of gray glacier, 14,000 years old, broken free and slowly turning back into water. Drawing near, blue icebergs towered out of the water several stories tall. The deep blue of the glacier is caused by the tendency of the ice to reflect blue light rays while absorbing others, known as Rayleigh scattering. The size of these bergs is misleading. For what you see on the surface is only one-seventh its total size, the rest immersed in water. After five miles, we arrived at its base and paused to listen as the ice field shifted and moaned. Creeping down from snow-capped mountains, these rivers of ice have the greatest influence on our planet's surface. This particular ice field is the third largest on the face of the Earth, behind Antarctica and Greenland. Glaciers originate as compacted snow in small mountain hollows, building up year after year. Eventually, under the great weight of the top layers, the lower layers are compressed into ice, and finally, when all the air is removed, into a dense matter called fern. Once the ice has sufficient depth, around several hundred feet, it can exact enough pressure and will begin to shift from its point of origin moving at rates from a few inches a day to dozens of yards, depending on the climate, precipitation, and the resistance at the sides and base. 
As it creeps downhill, its tremendous force grinds out the floor and sides of its valley, leaving behind the accumulation of debris it was carrying, called moraine. The results of glacial erosion can be seen in nearby striated rock surfaces. Constriction by resistant rocks cause pressure ridges and cause the ice to split open, forming deep crevasses. As not many people have the chance to get closer to a glacier or live in a place where you have a glacier, I feel really lucky because every time I'm near the glacier or I see the glacier, I feel how strong and how powerful nature is. Looking into the heart of something this old and powerful, you can't help but appreciate the timeless forces of geology at work here. This glacier is constantly changing, advancing, then receding, and it will continue to do so over the next several thousand years. It's one of the many marvels here in Patagonia that leaves an indelible impression on the adventurer, discovering places that so few get a chance to see, and that will be here long after we're gone.